So choice and marriage. This morning we looked at choice and the choice aspect. And our goal was really to separate the choice bit from the marriage bit. Because they're two very different issues. If we don't do that, I fear that we just make automatic marriage choices and you just can't afford to do that. You need to understand yourself a bit better than that. You need to know why you make the choices you make and the way you're making them, etc. We need to have a bit more self-analysis, really, and look at our own culture, look at our cultural upbringing, our parents, etc., etc. So with the choice bit understood, we move on to the, <laughs> to the, the dodgy bit, the dangerous bit, and that's marriage. Now, I'll put at the top of your notes there, the typical things that people get stressed out about. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can remember when I was in school and one of the first, I was about 13, and I had to drop some subjects. In other words, you had to knock like geography or whatever off your list. And I had to choose. And I can remember that was the the first kind of choice I was ever faced with. And I hated it. It it was a new experience, a challenge. What if I get it wrong? And, you know, speaking as a pastor, I can tell you that choices are traumatic. They're traumatic. And people, you know, get, 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 get trapped in them and anxious about them. Some people so confused about choices, they can't make any choice. Indecisive. And that's terrible. Just for a little bit of of, of study of the Word of God, you don't have to be like that. You can educate your decision-making ability. Plain and simple. You can study the Scriptures, and that will help you and give you confidence in making decisions. So, this may not be the number one thing people come to you with, but it's not far off the top of the list. It's number two or number three, you know? And the typical types of things that people will ask. Or what college should I go to? What university should I go to? What job should I apply for? What business should I start? What person should I marry? Which home should I buy? And I would just take a second to review some of those typical challenges and traumas often that people go through. Which college or which university should I go through? Some of you will know a man called Andrew Womack. Very, very good guy. Excellent guy. One of the best teachers in the world, I think, a real gift to the church. And Womack tells a story that many people may laugh at, you may laugh at, you may think he's off his trolley, he's off his rocker. I don't think so. I love this story. I I, I love Andrew Womack. I think he's a man of immense integrity. Listen to this. He's a young guy following God, come back from the army or whatever, and, and he's looking which university to go to. So he needs to make a decision. So his testimony is that he went before God and he said, God, should I go to, you know, Philadelphia, New York, or Boston? You see? And he said, God spoke so clearly, go to Boston, you know? So off he goes. And it's a complete disaster. Everything is wrong. He knows almost from the minute he arrives that it's wrong. And everything's wrong about it. And he's perplexed and he tries to see it through. But he's just made a decision. And it's wrong. And he's confused. So he goes back to God again. And he says, God, you told me to come here. You told me that this was the place to go. And the reply that God gave him is fantastic. God said to him, excuse me. You gave me three options. You never asked me. Which university was my choice? None of those three were any good. I gave you the best of the three. They were all a mess, you see? And I thought that was so good and and, and mind-expanding. We can offer God A, B, or C, and that is the wrong place to start. Which college should you go to? Give God a blank sheet. And I would say give God a blank, not just for college, but for everything else. Which type of business should I start? I used to deliver bread, you know, I was a bread man for a Jewish baker in Dublin. And you'd go to all these different places, very different types of business. And these two guys opened up in Dublin city centre. And they were, they were okay, a bit obnoxious sometimes, but they were okay. And they, 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 they took a lease out on this very large facility right in the middle of the city. And this is a new business, a new venture. And I tell you, they had that place 
looking fantastic. The tables were smart. Everything was really good. They had a, a posh menu with posh food, you know, and, and the, the very best of everything. Didn't make any money because nobody wanted it. And there they were, and I used to go down and deliver, first of all, a lot of bread, and then a little bread, and then hardly any bread at all. And then they started to change. What sort of business should you start? And instead of doing fancy food, they did burgers and chips. The place was full. You see? And and I noticed the change in the order. Now they're getting burger buns instead of, you know, all these fancy breads. And the guys were talking to me, and, you know, you can learn a lesson through that. What type of business do you start? (laughs) A type that makes money. Very simple. Very simple. But many people will go out and make a choice based on a lifestyle or a personal desire and forget that actually if you're going to start a business, you better get one that makes money. What sort of home should I buy? Well, you need to buy a few houses before you understand that. I think we, I don't, can't remember how many we've bought, about nine or something. Bought and sold about nine houses. But the only type of house that I will ever buy now is one I can sell. That's it. And after buying a few, now you wouldn't think of that on a first purchase. You wouldn't think, it wouldn't enter your mind. But there's a few people in this church (laughs) that have been trying to sell their houses for a long time. When you buy, I mean, I I bought the house off the previous pastor of this church. I bought it for one reason. Because as soon as I looked at it, I knew I could sell it. Because it had a massive back garden. You see? And that's why I bought it. Because it wouldn't trap me. I, I knew I'd be able to move on. But then I'd had previous experience in the property market. What sort of house should you buy? Well, just for a little bit of mature counsel or experienced counsel on such a decision, you can save yourself an awful lot of grief and an awful lot of money. So you begin to see decision-making, what we said this morning, don't do it alone. Sam, don't, don't. Don't do it alone. Seek advice. Get advice. Get wide-ranging advice from people who know what they're talking about in the various fields. And then our subject for tonight is who should I marry? Oh, wow. (laughs) Well, let me tell you, the type of person that you would marry when you're 25 is very different, perhaps, from the type of person you would (laughs) pick when you're 45. So you better be getting the decision right when you're 25, right? And that's where someone who's further down the road knows the outcome of these things And that's where mature counsel really does count. And that's why I'm very much in favor of parental consent. I've never never been asked to do a wedding where the parents weren't in agreement, but I don't think I could. If they were lost parents, that's a different story. They weren't saved, but if the parents were saved, man, I would. I I don't don't ever want to be in that position, because that's an awful position to be in. Because I'd probably say, no, you know what, if your mom or your dad is against this, I don't know if I can be for it. Nobody on this earth loves you more than your mum. Nobody. I know there's a few bad ones out there, but most of them, you know. <laughs> your mum would die for you. Your dad would die for you. So if they're saying yay or nay, you need to slow down a bit. Something's wrong, so I'd be very reluctant. So mature counsel is, is a huge issue when it comes to choosing a marriage partner. But in or- but before we go into that, before we look at choosing a partner for marriage, there's a bigger issue at stake here. And there's a bigger issue to understand, and it's this. The will of God. And what is the will of God, and, and how do I you know, fit into it? How do I you know, steer my life in terms of it? And it's maybe a little bit more complex than it seems. There are three aspects to the will of God. There's what we call the sovereign will of God. There's the moral will of God, and there's the individual will of God. Very different things. What's the sovereign will of God? Well, the sovereign will of God, if you like, is everything that's inside this box. It's everything that God permits. Some uh, Very close to it is the permissive will of God. Slightly different, but pretty similar thing. So, how would I know someone's talking about the sovereign will of God? Well, say someone gets killed. They're killed in a car crash or something. And you'll hear, often hear a Christian say, ah, nothing can happen on earth unless God permits it. Fair enough. It's the permissive or the sovereign will of God in a very general sense. 
And then within that, you notice there's a circle within the sovereign will of God because everything in here would not be his perfect will. But within that, there's a circle, and this is the moral will of God. How do we know what the moral will of God is? Well, you've got a Bible right there. And the moral will of God is revealed to us here. The sovereign will of God is revealed in everything we see, in the universe, in life. When you look at the wars and the happenings, it's the sovereign will of God, if you like. But within that, there's the moral will. And this is where you find the moral will of God. And then contained within that is what we're looking for. The individual will of God. The personal plan, if you like, or direction for me. The sovereign will, we don't understand much about. Who can fathom God's way? The moral will, we absolutely understand it. It's here. We're meant to understand it. That's why you've got a Bible. You're meant to understand it. So the moral will is explained to us. Don't understand the sovereign. Do understand the moral. And everybody's searching for the individual. Right? And just a little bit of, you know, teasing out of those three things or separating of those three things will, I hope, help you make better decisions, decisions you end up being happy with. So what I've done here is I've given you two sections at the bottom the second paragraph of your notes. The first one, just giving some general guidelines as to how to find the individual will of God, and then some just closing points which are equally important. But that first section there, for example, how do you seek and find the individual will of God for your life? Well, I worked in a, in a mental hospital for years, for about 10 years on a locked ward for the last five. And part of your job there was to try and get as many people as possible to make decisions. They were often people who had been on medication for years and they, they just don't do anything for themselves anymore. And it could take you weeks and weeks to get some of those guys just to get up and do something. And when they did, I would be delighted because they've done something for themselves. And I think God must get, you know, very frustrated with us sometimes. God, should I get out of bed? God, what do you think? Seeking God for simple, silly little things that are actually very clear in here already. Things we don't need to seek Him for at all. And I've given you a couple of examples there. There's actually many in Scripture, but in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, Nathan says to David, David, whatever you want to do, just go and do it. Kind of a strange thing to say, but David's heart at that moment was right with God. And David was saying, God wants you to grow up and, and, and make some decisions yourself, if you like. Because your mind, you've got God's mind on this topic or subject, right? The second one is in Acts chapter 15, verse 28, where Paul says it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. In other words, they felt that they knew the mind of God and their heart was leading them in the right direction. So you cannot, there, there's no way of replacing this, I'm afraid, folks. This is the mind of God right here in your hand. And the more you read it, the easier it will become to make decisions, knowing what God, no, I, I can't do that. I don't know where it is, I don't, but I just know it's not right. Or this is what to do. This is what God would do in this situation. Right? So the Bible remains number one in, in all of these things. Secondly, there's that inner witness. In terms of making a decision of any sort, but yes, a marriage partner, that inner witness, I, I have to say, folks, it's kind of scary. The lack, you, the lack of talk about people being led by their spirit. I'm working with several people at the moment on life-changing decisions. I hardly ever hear people say, well, God told me. This is what I know to be right. This is the leading of the spirit in me. And I'm in on some situations at the moment, I'm just keeping quiet for the third or fourth or fifth time and listening. And I'm thinking to myself, have you got a spirit? <laughs> Hello? Do you hear from your spirit? Do you hear from God? How on earth can you... Where's your relationship? Do you ask God things? Do you have a dialogue going on? Remember, if you haven't, you need to down tools, put everything down in your life and get your ear back. Amen. Nothing more important than that. You need to be able to hear from God. Singapore at the moment are looking for the next city to hit in Europe, you know. So the group over there have been 
looking for that city. There's 156 to choose from, by the way, cities we don't have churches in. But I also need to find that city as well. So we started praying last week, and I prayed for about two or three days. And there's a lot of cities there. I'm thinking, which one is it, Lord? I thought, there it is. It's Helsinki in Finland. You go to the map, where's that? You know. So I emailed Shane. I said, next city's Helsinki. I said, how did you know that? I will. I've heard it in my spirit, actually. He said, well, I just heard from Singapore. That's exactly where they're going. Amen. Now, you shouldn't be surprised. Amen? And if you're seeking things, if we call ourselves tripartite here, body, soul, and spirit, we should be hearing. You should be hearing. And if you're not hearing, why are you not hearing? Right? In terms of decision making, it's crucial. It's crucial. Husbands, to lead your wives. You need to hear. You need to have an ear attuned so that you're making right decisions and leading correctly. So set this, second point there. The inner witness. We don't hear enough about it. The third point, your personal desires. And because I come from a Catholic background, this was something that I had to get over. You know, God's in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, it says that God's will for you is... And, and, three things, good, pleasing, and perfect. Now, I don't think it comes much better than that, amen? I don't know what you would choose for yourself, but Scripture says very clearly that God's will for you is good, pleasing, and perfect. Now, because I come from my Catholic background, I thought God was out to give me a good hiding, right? And so anything good coming my way wasn't particularly in my mindset. And I had to change my thinking. And change, you know, change, because otherwise I've got negative faith operating in me and God could try and bless me and I wouldn't be able to receive that or I wouldn't see it, you know, be able to cooperate with God. But the will of God for you is good, pleasing, and perfect. Scripture says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. I've heard two interpretations of that. One is that He will give you what you desire. But the other one is that one interpreter said, well, that's not actually what it means. What it means is delight yourself in the Lord and he will put his desires in your heart. He will give you the very desires of your heart. He will create his desires in you. Quite a different take on it. But actually, both of them are are equally okay, right? God's a good God with a good plan for your life. Right? Not a bad one, a good one. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. So number one, the Bible remains supreme as terms in terms of making a decision about who you should marry. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. We need to get an inner witness on any big decision we make, any decision we make, but certainly big ones. And if you are not having a witness or a confirmation in your spirit about decisions you need to make, hey guys, fast, pray, get reading, do whatever you need to do, but get your hearing back. And fourthly, circumstances. Circumstances can help us make a decision. Now, some people go over the top on this, a bit like some people see demons behind every bush. You know that sort of person, right? In in, in terms of reading into circumstances, some people can read everything into every circumstance, and that's very unhealthy and very unstable. Amen. That's not wise at all. However... It's equally true that God does speak through circumstances. I was thinking uh, today, I, 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 a member in the church once said to me, why don't you take an evening off and come out for a meal with me and we won't talk anything about the church. You know, you know it's a trap then, don't you? Just come out and sit down and, and just relax for the night, you know. So I said, okay, yeah, okay, I'll meet you in such and such a place. And I turned up and unfortunately it was an Indian restaurant. Now, I love Indian food. But Indian restaurants are not the place to have a conversation, don't you know? They're extremely quiet. Very quiet. And, oh, I will never forget it. It's one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. So we go into this restaurant, we sit down. Now, praise God, when we arrived, there wasn't many people in there, but it soon filled up. And he's sitting, he had a big voice, a big, loud voice that filled the room. And all the tables come in and he's sitting there and he gets down. He didn't want to me to have an evening off. He wanted to talk about the fact he wanted a wife. 
So we sit there and he orders his, his, his dinner. And the first thing he says is, I was on the bus today, Pastor Mike. And everybody's thinking, he, he was on the bus. <laughs> and you should have seen the driver. There was a demon in him. And after a while, I could hear the tables as the people tried to bite their serviettes so they couldn't hear them. Here was them laughing, you know. And at one point he turned to me, he fancied this girl, and he said, I think she's the one. What do you think? You know, I said, well, you know, Pat, um, I tried to whisper. I thought that might lower his voice. Didn't work. He said, do you know why I think she's the one? Because I went into church the other day, and I put my coat on a seat. Guess what? She came in, and she put her coat on the same seat. Now, if that's not God, what is? Huh? He's in. He's in. Do you want some pudding? No, I'm not hungry. Let's just go. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Somebody, if you want to read into circumstances, folks, you can read into every circumstance all day. And that's, you know, that's not far off witchcraft, really. You've got to be careful of that stuff. If you're going to start looking for signs, Jesus said a wicked and perverse generation look for signs. What did he mean by that? Because there are signs. What does he mean? He means they've lost their actual hearing. They've lost their relationship with God. And they look for other ways of confirmation. They've stopped reading the scripture. They're out of communication with me. They are wicked. And when they can't hear me, they start looking for everything to confirm their desires, their wishes. There's your problem. You see? You can't get away from Scripture, folks. You can't get away from Scripture and you can't get away from maintaining your hearing at all times. It's dangerous to lose it. So circumstances are a clear way of of, of discerning the will of God often. Mature counsel, as I mentioned this morning, you need to get around you people, not your friends, not people who will, you know, be a yes man, not someone who will say what you want to hear, but actually seek out people who you know will tell you what you need to hear. That's what you need to do. We can all get friends who will say yes. And very often they're not actually friends at all because they'll only endorse your wrong decision making or whatever. You need to seek proper friends And Scripture is full of advice about that. You know, good friends who will give you a rebuke if you need it or clear correction if you need that. So all of these things will help you make decisions, yes, about marriage partners, but also about everything else. The Bible. Keeping an inner witness alive within you so you can hear God's voice. Knowing that your personal desires. Hey, God wants to bring you a a wife or a husband. He wants to bring you someone you're going to love. And God, it says in, uh, I can't remember where, God brought Rebecca to Isaac. And Isaac hated Rebecca? <laughs> no. It says, and Isaac loved Rebecca. Good choice, God. Good choice. So God's not going to bring someone to you that you're going to dislike or hate or whatever, you know. That wouldn't be God. God's desires, are, are his plans for you are good, pleasing and perfect. Right? So personal desires... They can line up with the will of God. Circumstances, but don't go over the top on that. Mature counsel, and lastly, on on their ways of of finding God's will, is just plain old common sense. Too many times I've seen this happen. Boys on fire for God. Girls on fire for God. Boy meets girl. Trouble. And six months later, boy's not on fire for God. Girl's not on fire for God. Six months later, there's less faith in their lives, less prayer in their lives, less of everything good, less church, less God. Six months together, and things just go down. So often, it can go downhill. Very, that's a bad sign. Amen? Because anybody God's bringing to you, they should, this is a great rule, they should bring you closer to God. If the man who's in your life is not himself journeying closer to God. My advice to you, (laughs) find another guy. Find another guy. 
Right? If the man in your life or the man you're seeking is not seeking after God, then keep looking, kid. Okay? If the relationship or friendship or boyfriend, girlfriend, if that thing is not bringing you closer to God, the best thing that you can do is put it down. Because it is simply not worth it. Very quiet. But it's very true, friend. I'm sorry. It's true. You see it all the time, especially when somebody starts to get close to the will of God. This is the point. As soon as someone starts getting close to the real plan of God, in will come a relationship. So often, and knock them off course. And you can counsel till the cows come home. So often they don't listen to you. Because they just get, you know, befuddled and bemused. They don't realize it's not you. This happens all the time. As soon as someone starts getting close to God, the devil will try this card, that card. I know what I'll do. I'll send this person, bang, and off they're, they're gone. And they lost that track that they were on with God. Any relationship that God sends me will be bringing me close to God. When I first started to court Jeanette, one of the things that that, that really stood out, I think very often, wives are better wives than men are husbands. It's okay if I say that, is it? (laughs) True? I think it's probably very true. I think most husbands are not as good at being husbands as wives are at being wives. Okay, I see a few people shaking their heads the wrong way there. Okay, no problem. (laughs) Good for you. (laughs) But one of the things that when I first started to, 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 to go out with Jeanette was being a man, I can get it wrong sometimes, and she would be so good for me. Even if I wanted to do something wrong, she would not permit me. That's a good wife. That's why I married her. Hallelujah. She's strong. She's got a pure heart. And men seek that, you know. Remember that, girls. Men seek a woman. Remember your Ezer Konegdo. Are looking for that woman who's stronger than he is. Because you are spiritually stronger. Right? Ezer Konegdo, one of superior strength. Help me. And I needed a help me. I didn't need a weaker woman. I didn't need a, a woman who would give in to my weaknesses or encourage me. In my weaknesses, I needed a woman who would help me with my weaknesses. Amen. And to this very day, that's what she is. Even if I want to do something wrong, she won't let me. Ah, Never mind. (laughs) And so is the role of the woman. The men lead, you see. That's a completely different thing. But men seek a woman who will help them grow. So what sort of woman should you be? What sort of woman, if you're going to attract the right guy, what sort of woman should you be? And if you're the wrong sort of woman, what sort of guy are you going to attract? You get the picture. So ladies, and I'll come to it in a moment, don't ever forget what you were made for. Don't forget, this is half the problem with the world. Hollywood's taken over and we've forgotten Genesis. You were made, you've been created to support a man. And your fulfillment. Now, hey, I'm for lady, you know, women leaders. We've got loads of them here and always have had. And I support women preachers and everything else to my nth degree. I'm not talking about anything to do with that. I'm talking about actually you being happy in life, as we dealt with this morning. Happy in life. You were made as the Ezer Konegdo. Your purpose of your existence, your creation, was to help a man. Okay? Was to be there to support him. Not to destroy him. Not to dominate him. Plenty of them around. Right? Not to dominate him. But to actually help him and lead him. Or not, not to lead him. Help him. Build him up. In every way. That's your real DNA right here. And of course, it was so little of this is actually perceived today. And we forget what we were made for. So that's the first, just general principles. But if if you lack on any one of those, and I would say that the inner witness is the biggest one you need to brush up on, because we don't hear enough of it, get your hearing back. But just as a general rule of thumb, those six points. And then the last part of the, the, the page there, the bottom paragraph, regarding marriage scripturally, it falls generally into the realm of your choice. In other words, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you will see some very surprising things. Look at me a moment. I'll say it again. You read 1 Corinthians. Go home and read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul says some things 
again and again that maybe you don't expect. You know what he says? If you choose to get married, fine. If you choose not to, fine. And then he goes again. If you choose to get married, that's fine. If you choose not to, fine. And it's the only passage of Scripture that actually takes the subject of marriage and guess where it puts it? <laughs> it, gives it, it gives it to you. And it gives it as an issue of maturity. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I, in fact, I believe, as with um, uh, Isaac and Rebecca and Adam and Eve, it was God brought Adam to Eve, etc., etc., Eve to Adam. I believe that God has a, in his plan that some people should marry, and I believe he can make that clear to them. But as a general rule, that's why I've said general, God often, it seems to me in 1 Corinthians, says you choose. You choose. You know, if you, if you choose to get married, that's fine. And Paul gives a list of advice about how to make that choice. And I've actually covered them in the last six points there on your page. The first question really you need to ask, and this is Paul's point, is not who you should marry. It's whether you should marry. Forget that one, don't we? <laughs> There's an automatic assumption that I should get married or you should get married. Who said? Who said? I've known several people. And they start going out with, you know, this one or that one. And you look at it and you think, you know what? I don't think you should get married. And they get married and they get divorced. And you look at it and you can just tell, you know. You meet some people and you think, you know what? I don't think you should get married ever. Not, I'm not saying anything wrong with that. I'm just saying some people are just not the sort. They're just not the type to actually live together. I won't mention any names, but they're running around in my head right now. <laughs> Right? There's some people who should not get married. And you can tell them till the cows come home again, but they, they, they're going to pursue it because they don't think of the first question. They don't think of that first question. And the first question, according to 1 Corinthians 7, and Paul, is if you choose. In other words, you're supposed to have done some form of assessment on yourself. And that's based on what we looked at this morning. Is it God's will? for me and is this something that's going to complement what God's design is for my whole life and if it is something that will complement that design then that's fine I could get married it's possible so the first question you need to ask yourself with a blank sheet not God should I marry you know Tom, Dick or Harry right not that but a blank sheet and you put that blank sheet up before it was got a D on it don't read anything into that blank sheet and you put it up before God, and you say, God, what do you say? And it, it, if, if, you know, circumstances, desires, things start to line up, then you could be in business. Fine. And then the second question is who? And that's largely based upon the, the subsequent points there, two till six. I'm, I'm at the bottom of the page. So first of all, in terms of choosing a marriage partner, it's not automatic. You ask yourself, and, and God, whether or not you should get married, then who, and then the choice you make is based upon really what God has called you to do in your life. So if you're called, you know, many people may have a career path or this, that, and the other, and that might just not be suitable. It might not be suitable that you get married. Some of you may be called into this ministry or that ministry, and it might not be suitable that you get married. And that's, that, that needs to be okay with us. But I emphasize that original purpose in, in, under point two. The original purpose of the woman, the happiest women that I, that I ever meet are the ones who are doing what they were made to do, supporting their husband. Support, in, in ministry, in things of God, I mean. Supporting him, lifting him up, helping him. They are the happiest. The third point, both marriage and singleness have advantages and disadvantages. Something you will do well to remember, folks. It, 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 there are advantages and again Paul goes into them there's advantages about being single and he says you know the chapter Paul says it is better to stay single remember now many people think that that was contextualized in other words he was talking about the day in which he lived because there was wholesale persecution going on at those times etc etc and Paul was saying look they're throwing people to the lions over here they're murdering in Ephesus and Thessalonica, etc., etc. Best thing to do right now is just don't get married, folks. Focus on the kingdom. And he was writing into a society like that. 
And they say, some people believe that's why Paul said that. I don't know. I don't know. However, in light of the day in which we live, I think it's good to get married for many. Not for all. Not for all, by any means. But it's good to get married for many because of the wickedness of the world in which we live. Okay? It's just gone. In the last days, wickedness will abound. And how true that is. And in light of that fact, I think it's a, it, it is, you know, for many, a good idea to get married. Okay? Fourthly, the goal, remember, is not to change your status. Some people, that alarm clock goes off inside them, you know? The biological alarm clock starts to ring and ring and ring. And the only thing they think about is getting married. I've got to get married. I've got to get married. I've got to find the right person. And they off, off they go. And that's not your goal, is it? can't be your goal just to get married. Your goal needs to be to find the will of God for your life and, and, and let that dictate everything else. Once you've plugged into the central will of God for you, then everything else should follow suit, right? Not marriage first, not letting that usurp the queue here, but some people are so mad on just changing their status. It's not about God. It's not about the other. It's just that thing. I've got to get married. No, you don't. Yeah, I need to have sex. No, you don't. You need air. You need food. <laughs> but you don't need sex, believe me. Remember? There's a list of needs and there's a list of desires. And one of the tricks of the devil is to take off the list of desires and make you think it's in your list of needs. Well, it isn't. You don't need sex. And But these things drive people. We had... Oh, we had one lady who was determined to get married. (laughs) This is a tragedy. I shouldn't laugh, but it's hilarious. She was determined to get married. Here, you'll do. Come here. You want to get married? I said, calm down. Wait. No, it's all right. I want to get married. Hey, come here. Calm down. Listen, listen to this. She gets on a plane and she goes to London and she comes back back in the church and she's all sheepish. I'm thinking, hello, what's wrong? Tell us, and she's a lovely lady, what's wrong? I'm getting married. Who are you getting married to? You're only in London two weeks. I'm getting married. Who is it? I said, listen, please don't do this. Please don't. Next thing, she was gone. Married, brings him back over. And I had him on his own. I was talking to him. And I said, listen, I, I did not, I'm not in agreement with what's happened. I did not want this. That's just a woman who's determined for marriage. Not a person. You think this has got to do with you? Friends, I've got some information for you. This has got nothing to do with you. You think that she's married? No, 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 no. This is a woman with one thing on her mind. Marriage. It doesn't matter which person. (laughs) It just happens that you have taken it. And I was saying, what? If I'm not finished, listen to this. Listen to the end of the story. You're not going to believe this. I said to him, why did you marry her? And this was his answer. Because she makes the best stew I've ever tasted. (laughs) And I thought, what? And he said, well, where I I come from, my village and, you know, whatever group he came from. when, When the woman comes, the woman comes and the woman cooks a meal. And if the meal is good, you marry the woman. That's what's what happened, you know. And you married her for... A bowl of stew? So anyway, they ended up getting divorced and that was the end of that. The goal is not to change your status, right? Don't make that your goal. Don't get all panicky about that. That's just your emotions getting stirred up and they should not lead your life. Your goal should be to serve God, right? Remember what we did and what's love got to do with it. Become the right person, right? You book fast the first thing. And you adhere to that. You adhere to becoming the right person, doing what God wants you to do with your life. And then, if it is fitting, and if it is beneficial and suitable, let God bring someone, if that's good for you. You may think it's good for you, but God may know better. Right? And the last one, or the second last one, God's, the, the moral will of God needs to govern all your choices. So any choice you make, needs to be inside that moral will. And the last one, 
And that's, this is a fantastic one. The Word of God is adequate for all of your decision making. So you don't need to have a voice from heaven to tell you who you should marry. You can read this. You can read it and read it and read it and read it. And it will do like Nathan to David. It will begin to give you the mind of Christ. That's what will be developed within you. So the decisions you have to make, you will be able to make in the Spirit and be confident of them. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team back. I'm going to ask you to stand. And I want to give you a moment just to pray about any decision that you're laboring on right now. Just stand to your feet with me a moment. And I want to give you a moment just to to pray about any decision that you may be laboring over right now. Just bow your head. Close your eyes. Hallelujah. Father, I ask you to come down upon this congregation. And at whatever point any individual here may be in trauma or struggling or in stress over a decision, would you come, Holy Spirit, and give us godly wisdom, give us God's own direction, and enable us to put childish ways aside and to be governed by the will of God for us. I pray you will take away the stresses and the strains of decision making and and may the Holy Ghost fill us, baptize us again so that we can make decisions confidently, boldly, standing firmly on the Word of God. I just give you a moment to, to make your peace with God and to give back to Him anything you have been struggling with.